Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I have the distinct privilege this morning of being in Keith House, in the community room, in front of the fireplace. And I, ha I was saying to Ted this morning that I can't remember the any time that I went for two months without being in this room, even two weeks without being in this room. So welcome to Morning Song at the Folk School. And I thought it'd be great if we all sang a good morning song, the easiest one that I can think of. And it goes like this. I'll sing it a couple times. You can uh, pick it up pretty easily. It goes, we welcome in the morning. We welcome in the day. We welcome in the morning. We welcome in the day. Now it's actually a round, so you can pick your part. There are three parts. So <clears throat> the, I sing, we welcome in, and you come in, we welcome in, we welcome in. So pick your part, we'll sing it through three times. We welcome in the morning, we welcome in the day. We welcome in the morning, we welcome in the day. We welcome in the morning, we welcome in the day. Well, it's great to be with you this morning. Usually, I do morning song on Monday morning. And so um, a lot of students who, many of whom are here for the first time, and I talk to them a little bit about <clears throat> the history of the folk school. And um, I always like to answer what I think are gonna be two of their very burning questions. One is, what is a folk school? And number two, who is John C. Campbell? And maybe a third question would be, how did a folk school get to Brasstown? So, <clears throat> what is a folk school? Well, the term actually originated in Denmark in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, at that time, Denmark became a constitutional monarchy. And they were faced with the problem of how do we take a large rural population with limited educational opportunities and bring them up to speed so that they can participate in a modern democracy. And one of the solutions to this problem was proposed by um, a man named Nikolai Grundvi. Uh, Grundvi was a clergyman. He was also a philosopher, a poet. Um, he's very, very well known in Denmark and hardly known at all outside of Denmark. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Grundvi had spent some time at Cambridge University in England and while he was there, he noticed that a lot of really important thinking and education happened informally in the colleges where the students would live with their tutors and they would have uh, opportunities for informal conversations and dialogue. And he thought, well, this is really an important way that education can happen. And so he proposed this idea of non-formal uh, education that would be a, sh a short term kind of thing. Um, and it would emphasize uh, things like uh, uh, <clears throat> togetherness, community, um, tolerance. And uh, he uh, had this idea, but he never really got to implement it. And it was taken up by others. And by the end of the 19th century, there were quite a few of these folk schools uh, in Denmark. Um, providing mostly an opportunity for young people between the ages of about 18 and 25 uh, opportunities to come uh, together for periods of four to six months, usually during the winter time since most of them were involved in, in farming. Um, and they would be have an opportunity to have dialogue with the teachers and there was it was not it was not formal education there were there was no entrance requirements no grades no exams um, and it would basically stimulate the intellect uh, or as 
Olive Dame Campbell said later on, enlightened and enlivened. And so uh, this folk school idea caught on. And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how it got to Brasstown. Uh, but the idea of these folk schools, it was, it was probably maybe the most progressive educational idea uh, of its time and even maybe today. So uh, who was John C. Campbell? That's the next question. Well, John C. Campbell was the son of a Scottish immigrant. His father came over to this country uh, as a uh, railroad worker. He was basically a machinist that worked on the railroads and basically worked his way up to being a, a, a railroad executive. And this is by the late 19th century. Uh, so John was brought up in the Midwest, uh, moving around with his father to several different places where his father was working on railroads. He was a very bright young man and his parents decided that uh, they wanted him to further his education, so they sent him to prep school uh, at Andover Academy in New England. Uh, after that, he attended Williams College, also in Massachusetts, and then he decided to go to Andover Theological Seminary, and he studied. Uh, he actually was never ordained. Uh, he decided to become a missionary. Uh, and missionaries at that time, instead of going to Africa or Haiti, they went to Appalachia. And in fact, by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, there were probably a dozen different church groups that had missions in the mountain region. And uh, so John uh, initially applied to the American Missionary Association. He was sent to uh, several small schools, uh, one in Northern Alabama, one in East Tennessee. And then uh, they asked him to go to a small college in North Georgia now called Piedmont College in Demarest, Georgia. And uh, he initially uh, was appointed dean of the college and very soon after, at a relatively young age, became president of the college. Uh, and unfortunately, this college was in terrible financial condition. Um, and uh, John really loved mountain people. He loved working with the people. Uh, but as college president, it sort of took him away from uh, direct interaction with the students and more into doing what college presidents do, which is raising money. And um, uh, so it was quite a stressful position. And in addition to that, uh, he, he was married. He had married his high school sweetheart and she had developed tuberculosis and she died while they were down in, in, at uh, Piedmont College. So uh, John was highly stressed out. In addition to that, he had a uh, congenital heart condition, and uh, his health suffered to the point where his doctor told him he really needed to take some time off. So he decided to take a trip to Scotland to visit his father's family over there, and that turned out to be quite fortunate because on the ship going over, he met uh, a woman from Massachusetts, Mrs. Lauren Dame, and her two daughters, Ruth and Olive. and. Uh, they got to be good friends on the trip over. Uh, the dames were enchanted by all his stories of his adventures in the mountains. And uh, uh, they got to be quite close friends and they ended up traveling some together in the British Isles and booking passage on the same ship coming back. And Olive later wrote that uh, by the time they got back, uh, she and John were practically engaged. So in fact, they did eventually get married. Um, they spent uh, a honeymoon in Sicily so that John could fully recover his health. Uh, they came back to uh, North Georgia and decided to uh, wrap up the, the job there and go on to something else. And uh, while they were looking around for what that next thing would be, uh, they discovered a new foundation that had just come into being called the Russell Sage Foundation. And the Russell Sage Foundation was a philanthropic organization that was interested in studying and improving conditions, uh, social and economic conditions in various parts of the country. So uh, John decided to uh, apply to the Russell Sage Foundation for a grant to study conditions in the Southern Mountains uh, and recommend ways that those conditions could be improved. Um, 
this uh, application was accepted probably largely because they didn't ask for very much money. Uh, in fact, they only asked for their expenses. And um, so in 1907 and 1908, uh, John and Olive embarked on a trip through the Southern Mountains uh, covering, I think they started in East Tennessee. They went through parts of Western North Carolina and North Georgia. And um, during, in the course of this trip, they stayed with uh, local folks. Uh, they talked to everybody. They talked to uh, farmers. They, they talked to civic leaders. They talked to teachers. They talked to clergy. Uh, and they, uh, several things happened in the course of this trip. Um, one of them was that uh, John discovered that the thing that people in the mountains really wanted most were educational opportunities. And also in the course of this trip, Olive began to uh, hear people singing the old ballads and she started writing them down and making a collection, which later on, much later on, uh, she ended up collaborating with the English folklorist Cecil Sharp and uh, uh, published a, a collection, a landmark collection of ballads called English Folk Songs from the Southern Mountains. Anyway, uh, they completed their trip. Uh, they wrote a report to the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, the Russell Sage Foundation then asked John to be their Southern representative so Olive and, and John moved to Asheville and opened the uh, southern, southeastern office of the Russell Sage Foundation in Asheville, and they continued their travels. And one of the most important things that, that John uh, Campbell did during this time was he realized that there were all these different church groups that had missions in the, in the mountains, and they seemed to all be working at cross purposes to each other. So he, he thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was some way to uh, let these people communicate with each other and exchange ideas and, and work together? And so he created uh, an annual conference of Southern workers uh, that eventually became called the Council of the Southern Mountains. Uh, eventually they had an office in Berea, Kentucky, and um, they published a, a newsletter and had this annual conference every year. And uh, that was one of the most important things, I think, that John C. Campbell did. Um, so uh, <clears throat> after, another thing that happened during their trip, their initial trip through the mountains, was they met uh, a man from East Tennessee named uh, Claxton, who was the superintendent of education for Tennessee. He later became U.S. Commissioner of Education, and he was the one that told them about folk schools in Denmark. Um, and he said, you know, this is something you ought to study and you ought to consider it. It might be something that would really work well for our mountain region. And they kind of put that in the back of their heads and said, yeah, we need to do that. So by the time they finished uh, their trip and they settled in, in Asheville and uh, continued doing their study of the mountains, they, they thought about that it would be great to go and study the folk schools in Denmark. Um, unfortunately, by the time they got around to being able to do that, uh, World War I broke out and they couldn't go. So uh, they put that on the back burner. But, uh, and unfortunately, um, in 1919, John, who was only 52 years old, uh, had a heart attack and died suddenly. And um, uh, Olive uh, then uh, took all of John's notes and uh, all of her notes from their initial trip through the mountains and uh, went back up to her family's cottage on Nantucket Island and uh, determined to turn these notes into a book. And uh, eventually she did, and it was published, um, called The Southern Highlander and His Homeland uh, by John C. Campbell, although actually most of it was written by Olive, and she was a wonderful writer, I should say. And uh, this book is still, you can still get a hold of it, uh, and it's still required reading in any course on Appalachian studies, The Southern Highlander and His Homeland. She finished the book, and then she decided that the next thing that she needed to do to carry on with their work uh, was to visit the folk schools in Denmark. So she recruited her sister Daisy and a young teacher that they had met 
at a settlement school in Eastern Kentucky named Marguerite Butler. And in 1922, the three of them uh, set off for Denmark and they spent almost a year uh, in Denmark and they visited about 35 different folk schools, not only in Denmark, but in some of the other Scandinavian countries as well. Um, <clears throat> and when they came back, um, they determined to do two things. One was to found a folk school. And two, um, Olive thought she would like to write a book about the Danish folk schools, and she eventually did uh, and published it. Unfortunately, it's out of print and rather hard to get a hold of. But, uh, uh, if you can find Olive Dame Campbell's book on the, on the folk schools, uh, hold on to it. It's a great book. So <clears throat> uh, they started to look around for a place to put a folk school. And now we come to kind of a question of how did it get to Brasstown? And uh, the, the person that really is responsible for it being in, in Brasstown uh, is a gentleman named Fred O. Scroggs who was the storekeeper in Brasstown. Uh, local folks still refer to him as Fred O. And uh, Fred O was quite a character. He was, he was a wheeler dealer of the first order. Uh, he had his hand on the pulse of everything that was going on in the community. And Fred O um, uh, somehow got wind of the fact that Marguerite Butler was coming to Murphy and looking around to put a school somewhere. So Fredo took his father and they went and they visited her and they said, uh, we know of an excellent place for you to put a school. And uh, they said, if you'll, if you'll come back in, in a few weeks time, <clears throat> uh, we're gonna organize the community and have a meeting and you can come and explain to us what it is that you wanna do. Uh, so that happened. They put together a meeting at Little Brasstown Baptist Church and uh, it, apparently it was, so many people were there that they couldn't even fit them all in the church. People were outside looking in the windows. Uh, and uh, so Marguerite gave a, a presentation. And also during that time, Fred O had gone around in the meantime to folks in the community and gotten them to sign pledges. If you go to the History Center at the folk school, you can actually see some of these pledge slips that he had people sign uh, donating hours of work, uh, money, materials, et cetera, et cetera, in order to build the folk school in Brasstown. So after that meeting, Marguerite had a really good sense of the fact that folks in the community were really uh, behind this idea of putting the folk school in Brasstown. And uh, so later that year, she and Olive came, uh, the Scroggs family donated 25 acres of land to start the school. And the only building that was actually here at the time was the farmhouse. And um, they actually uh, had classes for local people in the farmhouse for a couple of years while they were building the rest of the folk school. Uh, this building, uh, the community room, was the next uh, project. Uh, it was constructed. This beautiful fireplace back here was uh, the work of Leon Deschamps, a Belgian gentleman who uh, came to work at the folk school at one time. Um, when the folk school started, uh, I should tell you that uh, the term folk school, both in Danish and in English, uh, really doesn't refer to the content that's taught. You know, when I first heard about the folk school, I thought, oh, that must be a place where they teach folk dance, folk music, folk uh, craft, folk tales. But actually, folk school just means a school for ordinary people, not just the privileged few. And most folk schools, uh, there's folk schools in Denmark, and there are about 70 of them now, uh, have various things that they teach. Uh, there are folk schools that specialize in Bible studies and theology, and folk schools that specialize in eco ecological issues. Um, I, I visited two folk schools in Denmark, and they were both sports schools. Imagine. So uh, the content varies. And this folk school, when it started, and for about the first half of its existence, was a farm school, a school that taught skills that would be useful for folks living and working on a farm. So uh, one of the things that uh, Olive Campbell did was to hire a young man from Denmark named George Bidstrup, 
to come over and teach modern dairy farming techniques because dairy farming was something that was happening quite a bit in, in this community and at the time. So the, the folk school really started um, after this uh, community room was built, which was considered the most important building because it was a place to bring people together, to bring the community together. Um, and in, in addition to, to serving students, the folk school also served the community in a whole lot of ways. So, for example, there was a credit union here. Uh, there was a dairy cooperative so that the local farmers could market their, their milk together. Uh, there, there was a, a women's club and a men's club and, uh, of course, recreational activities that involved the community. There were what they called the Friday night games. That was dancing, by the way. You couldn't talk, say it was dancing because the church was uh, solidly against that. But they did have Friday night games that involved the community. Uh, now we have uh, Saturday night games, I guess you could say. Uh, and we hope to have them again sometime in the future. So <clears throat> uh, the folk school became really a, a center uh, for the community. And typically in those early days when they started having students, it was a small group of students and they were here from November through March because that was the time when the, they were not, they, it was mostly young people that were not needed on their uh, local farms. So uh, the folk school was a, a farm school and continued that way. Um, of course, there were a few years during World War II where there was not much going on. Um, and then it started up again. And after World War II, of course, they started having courses for returning veterans uh, in addition to other things. So uh, it was really in the mid 1970s that the folk school, which had been a working farm. In fact, I visited the folk school for the first time in uh, 1970, um, and uh, I was put to work for a couple of days in the dairy barn. Um, and there was still an active uh, dairy at that time. In fact, a, a friend, I was visiting a friend of mine who was a member of the dairy crew, uh, lived down in Tower House. And uh, that was when the uh, dairy, the the milking barn was the old blacksmith shop here. And then later on, what we now call the festival barn was built as the new uh, improved milking barn. But unfortunately, shortly after that was built, and this is in the 1970s, um, the folk school found that they couldn't really support the farm operation anymore. Uh, lots of changes were happening. Uh, new roads and highways coming in and a lot of things that the folk school had done. For example, the folk school had been the community library for a long time. Well, public libraries came in, public schools came in, the community college came in, lots of other opportunities. And so the folk school began to suffer as far as being able to attract uh, those students to come in for that long period of four or five months uh, every year. So in the mid 1970s, the folk school almost had to, had to close its doors but fortunately, uh, they kind of reinvented themselves as a craft school, what we are today, and underwent a transition from the long courses uh, that they would have in the winter time to having short courses, week long, weekend classes, year round. Now, some of the Danish folk schools do that too. Um, typically, they would have short courses in the summertime and the regular long courses the rest of the year. So our folk school started having short courses all year round. And, and that basically has enabled this folk school to survive and thrive into the modern era. Of course, today we're, we're kind of struggling to figure out what's gonna happen next as everybody else is. Uh, but we're hoping that uh, without in a short amount of time we hope that uh, we'll go back to being the folk school that we know and love so um, that's kind of where we are right now um, trying to redefine ourselves into the future and I guess every other uh, institution is trying to do the same so that's basically the story of the folk school and uh, I'm 
thankful for the opportunity. I'd like to thank Ted Cooley for uh, taking care of all the technical stuff. And uh, uh, he and Martha Owen are sitting way back, back in the back there with their face masks on. I, I sure appreciate that. Well, I thought we ought to end up by singing a song together. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, singing is a very important part of folk schools in Denmark. Uh, this morning song tradition that we have, um, we got from the Danish folk schools. But I will tell you one thing, and that is that in Denmark, they would, wouldn't dream of having morning song before breakfast just wouldn't happen. Um, it would be sometime, probably after morning coffee. Uh, you know, they have about five or six meals every day in Denmark. You have breakfast, you have morning coffee, you have lunch, you have afternoon coffee, you have supper, you have evening coffee. So, morning song, great tradition, and singing is a very important part of the folk school tradition. Uh, Grundvi, the, the founding father of folk schools, uh, wrote numerous songs. And uh, folk schools in Denmark have their own song books. And many of the songs in there are hymns that were written by Grundy. Well, we have a folk school song book too. And in fact, it arrived at the folk school in 1991 at about the same time that I came here to work. And uh, the very first song, in our songbook is a wonderful song by Bill Staines, and it's called All God's Critters Got a Place in the Choir. So I hope you'll sing along with me on the chorus. Now, Martha, if you want to uh, play your banjo in back in the distance there, uh, folks might be able to hear it along with me. So the chorus of this song goes, uh, all of God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or pause or anything they got now. We'll try it one more time. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or pause or anything they got now. Now there's some hand motions that you can do along with that if you if you really want to get into it. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud, out loud, on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands, a pause, or anything they got now. You ready? Well, listen to the bass, it's the one on the bottom where the bullfrog croaks and the hippopotamus moans and groans with a big to-do. But the old cow just goes, ooh. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Well, the dogs and the cats, they take up the middle where the honeybee hums and the crickets fiddle. The donkey brays and the pony bays and the old coyote howls. Ow! All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Well, listen to the top where the little birds sing on the melody with the high notes ringing. The hoot owl hollers over everything and the jay bird disagrees. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Singing in the nighttime, singing in the day. The little duck quacks and is on his way. The possum ain't got much to say. And the porcupine talks to himself. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or pause or anything they got now. 
It's a simple song of living sung everywhere by the ox and the fox and the grizzly bear, the grumpy alligator and the hawk above, the sly raccoon and the turtle dove. All God's critters got a place in the choir. Some sing low, some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. And some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. Thank you all very much for joining me for morning song. I'd like to especially thank Ted Cooley for setting up these Friday morning song programs and doing all the technical stuff. And thank you, Martha Owen, for that distant banjo in the background. And uh, have a great day, everybody. And uh, hope we'll see you at the folk school sometime soon. <laughs>